Thank you, everybody, for joining our uh, uh, Michael J. Fox Foundation webinar today. Uh, our hot topic today is going to be uh, sort of an overview of, of our uh, the uh, 2013 year uh, in research and sort of some of the areas that uh, that we think are exciting. Um, uh, is, uh, as I said, it's sort of the end of the year for us. Obviously, we're very busy uh, uh, trying to wrap up a, a good funding year, and we hope to uh, provide you with some of that excitement in today's webinar. But first, I, I want to uh, introduce uh, a couple of our panelists. Um, first, I would like to introduce and welcome Dr. Kalpana Merchant, uh, who is Chief Scientific Officer of Translational Science at Eli Lilly and Company, and is also a member of the Michael J. Fox Foundation Scientific Advisory Board. Uh, welcome, Kalpana. Thank you, Brian. Uh, I also, uh, as always, am very pleased to welcome back Dave Iverson, uh, who is MGFF's contributing editor and a member of our patient council. Uh, and Dave will be moderating our webinar discussion today. Welcome, David. Good morning, Brian. Uh, and, and finally, I want to just thank our sponsors, uh, Medtronic DBS Therapy and Merck, uh, who are supporting our 2013 Hot Topics webinar series. Uh, I should say also that Merck is one of the supporters of our flagship biomarker effort, the Parkinson's Progression Marker Initiative, which uh, you'll hear a little bit uh, more about in a moment. Um, anyway, we're very um, grateful to these sponsors for allowing us to be able to do these web series for, for all of you. So with that, uh, I will hand things over to Dave for our discussion today. Thank you. And, and Brian, I'm not sure you introduced yourself, so I will do that. Oh, I'm um, sorry. That yes, is Brian, good, good. Brian Fisk, our, our Vice President of Research Programs at the Michael J. Fox Foundation. So thank you, Brian. Um, and thanks, everyone, for, uh, for joining us um, for this kind of year in review and, and look ahead at 2014, because a lot of interesting things happened in this past year, which will aim us towards what we hope can be accomplished in 2014. Lots of exciting developments and some disappointments as well, and we want to talk about um, all of those things. And I want to encourage everyone to submit their questions um, to Kalpana and to Brian, um, and we'll try to get to as many of those as we can uh, starting in about 25 minutes. There's a, a window on your screen where you can type in your question and send it to us. Um, and we've already gotten a number of questions about exactly what we're going to be talking about. Um, one person wants to know what's been accomplished in terms of neuro protection. What about new treatments in the pipeline? Um, what are the new non dopamine based treatments um, what about the progress for the vaccine that has to do with alpha synuclein so those are exactly the kinds of things we want to we want to cover in our in our discussion today uh, so let's get started um, when I was talking with both um, Brian and um, uh, Kalpana about um, what we want to do in our conversation and what we want to talk about in terms of highlights for this past year um, the first thing that really came up was was progress that's being made in identifying a, a biomarker for Parkinson's. As probably everyone on this call knows, it's something that we don't have yet, unlike diseases like um, heart disease or, or hypertension, where something like cholesterol or high blood pressure can kind of tell us what's going on with the disease. We don't have that. And yet a lot of progress has been made in finding our way towards identifying a biomarker for for Parkinson's. And so we want to review a little bit of that um, first. As you see in this bullet point that's just come up, it'll tell us something about being able to diagnose the disease, about how the disease is progressing. And Brian, if you would chime in on the last point about um, patient selection and grouping, what that means, because it's been a problem with, as we'll discuss throughout this call, in clinical research to know exactly who we're testing because we don't really have a way of being very precise about the patient population. Yeah, no, I think this is this is uh, probably a, one of the most critical needs for biomarkers is just that, um, you know, classically when we look at people with Parkinson's, we tend to sort of uh, view them through the lens of what they look like clinically, so what are sort of the broad range of symptoms that they have. But uh, a lot of that kind of um, uh, the sort of selection process doesn't really take into account, at least not currently, what's happening sort of under the hood, so what's actually driving that person's individual disease uh, biologically. And so um, that can make it really difficult when you do a clinical trial and you're trying to test a, a, a drug which sort of, you know, by def definition is acting on some kind of disease biology. If you're not picking the right people who actually have that altered biology, then you may not actually 
we wouldn't expect to really be getting a good effect of that drug in those people. So having biomarkers that can really help you sort of, you know, uh, tease apart which of those patients, even if they clinically all look very similar, have uh, different underlying biology driving their disease. If you could sort of select the right people out based on those more biological signs, that could really help um, um, clinical trials be much more effective. And part of what was made such a made such a headway with this this year is with the Parkinson's Progression Markers Initiative. The Fox Foundation has initiated. The recruitment was completed um, this year for that. And I know, Kalpana, you feel like this is really a landmark event this past year, that recruitment's been completed on this uh, effort to identify uh, a biomarker. And, and if you would, Chime in on why this is so important from an industry point of view, why finding biomarkers will make the pharmaceutical industry that much more um, engaged in the, in the effort to find good treatments for Parkinson's. Yeah, so what's the most critical for us, and Brian alluded to with this, is how do we design our clinical trials? Typically, our phase three clinical trials are in the uh, uh, range of about 18 months. Anything longer is very, very complicated to accomplish and much more expensive. So this PPMI study, Parkinson's Progressive Markers Initiative study, very briefly, it's a natural history study where we are studying Parkinsonian patients versus controls to ask the question, how do a set of biomarkers change during the course of the disease when you start monitoring the patients at a very early stage? That will give us an information, some information on the rate of changes in different biomarkers. And once we know that, um, then we can plug that into a model to say, how many patients would we need if we had a disease-modifying therapy to be able to see a change in the curve of that rate of progression. That's one thing. How many patients do we need? Secondly, what time points should we be assessing the patients at following the initiation of the therapy? Do we do it at six months, 12 months, 18 months? And all of that would depend on the rate of change in the biomarker. The third thing is which biomarkers should we even evaluate? Sometimes we would evaluate biomarkers only for internal decision-making as an interim endpoint and say, do we see anything that's promising enough, say, at three months or six months to continue the investment for another 12 to 18 months? That is sorely needed right now for internal decision-making without having any regulatory implications for the biomarker. So uh, this study, the PPMI study, was designed to help answer all of those questions to inform how do we develop a disease-modifying therapy of Parkinson's disease. Um, and, and it's very parallel to a study that's been done in Alzheimer's disease, which has formed the cornerstone of every single phase three trial that I know of for disease modification in Alzheimer's disease. And I think we'll accomplish that for Parkinson's through PPMI. And just briefly, Brian, um Give us a, a bit of a, a news on as far as what we've learned so far this year um, about potential biomarkers, because we're starting, although recruitment's just been completed and the study is, is still ongoing, um, we're beginning to learn something about what a potential biomarkers might be. Yeah, yeah, we definitely, I mean, so what's nice is, um, you know, first of all, all the PPMI data from the study are being made available um, for the community to download and use, and so we're actually seeing a lot of use of these data now, and, and, and including a number of publications that uh, people have, uh, where people have started to incorporate some of this data. And of course, the study itself has also published some, some findings uh, recently as well. In fact, there was a paper this summer that uh, has been exploring sort of protein biomarkers in spinal fluid and has found some interesting hints that there are at least some proteins that seem to be um, uh, found in different levels, basically reduced in people with Parkinson's disease compared to healthy controls. So, so these are just kind of early hints right now, but at least that are telling us that there is something sort of different in, biologically in some of these individuals. And in fact, what we're even finding, to back to sort of the original point, uh, uh, question you raised earlier, uh, Dave, is that it seems that certain subtypes, certain types of Parkinson's patients might actually have uh, a slightly different profile of these um, uh, protein biomarkers than other types of Parkinson's disease. And so that suggests that we may even be able to tease out within Parkinson's disease patients certain individuals 
who have a different type of uh, a biologic uh, biomarker change. And, and the reason why that's so key then, again, would be that if we had that information, we could put one kind of patient in one group and another in a different group, and it would allow us to figure out whether some drugs might work better with one set than another. Is that right? Exactly, exactly. So you might then, you know, theoretically at least, you know, use some of these protein uh, biomarkers found in spinal fluid to, you know, when you're sort of selecting your patients, decide, okay, you fall into the group that has clear reduction of, you know, protein X in your spinal fluid, and based on our understanding of what we think our drug might be doing uh, in the body, you would be the best potential responder to this drug versus someone who doesn't have that change, and maybe they would not be appropriate for that trial. So, again, it's just getting back to Kalpana is a need for sort of efficiency in clinical trials, especially when it comes to both cost and time. Uh, if we could enrich that patient selection process for people who might actually respond to the drug, that would make the whole process much faster, cheaper, and, and hopefully more informative. So in a sense, it's, it's really doing all the groundwork we have to do before we really can make progress on what we're going to talk about next, which is disease-modifying drugs. If we don't have the right yardstick, it's hard to know whether or not we're actually modifying the disease. And, and that brings us to the, the next point that I just want to touch on briefly, which is that we're, the next effort is going to be to try to get at um, how um, we can identify the disease and find a marker for the disease at the earliest possible point. And I've just clicked through a number of factors that you're going to be looking at next, um, Brian, which is everything from genetic risks to loss of sense of smell to sleep problems because as always with any condition, if we can get in early, we have the best prospects for bringing about change. And so just give us a quick snapshot of where we are on this new effort to, to figure out uh, a, a biomarkers for, for people who may be at risk to develop Parkinson's. Yeah, so this is kind of an exciting uh, highlight from this year. We really, you know, obviously we continue to follow the people, um, the newly diagnosed people with Parkinson's to, to understand biomarkers uh, in those individuals. But um, as we've uh, slowly uh, moved forward and, and covering a lot of potential early signs of Parkinson's, even before you start exhibiting the motor symptoms of the disease, we've been able to actually um, at least develop some initial you know, approaches to try to find these at-risk individuals. And so, you know, as you alluded to on the slide, you know, there are some certain genetic risk factors we can look for. Uh, there is a, uh, an idea that, you know, loss of smell is an early sign of Parkinson's as well as a sort of an odd sleep, uh, sleep disorder called our, uh, REM sleep behavior disorder, which if we, we find in people with, um, you know, uh, uh, Parkinson's disease, they tend to have these uh, symptoms early on in the disease. So by using these in various combinations, with other, other diagnostic criteria, we can actually sort of find people who might be at increased risk for PD and then start uh, studying them in the same way that we are doing with Parkinson's patients in the PPMI study. So this ultimately will help us to, we hope, find some uh, early signs and criteria that we could actually use to really um, sort of define someone's risk for Parkinson's. And then, as you say, if, if um, we have then therapeutics that we could uh, potentially use to uh, slow down that, that process, then we could actually even maybe prevent uh, at least full-blown Parkinson's disease in these individuals, and that would obviously be a very uh, major, major advance for the field. So let's begin our conversation then about, about where we are with um, uh, disease-modifying treatments, because having that progress on establishing the framework, the measuring device for identifying patients, figuring out how they're progressing, will help us determine whether these approaches that we're looking at now may have real uh, possibilities. Um, and I, I want to begin um, actually with the, with the second point, Kalpana, which is um, the, the the question of alpha-synuclein therapy. We'll come back to serogene, which was sort of the big disappointment of 2013 in a moment. But I want to start with the alpha-synuclein possibilities because I know you feel that by identifying this problem of the protein that clumps up in the brain of someone with Parkinson's and beginning to figure out a way that you might be able to bust up that clumping or perhaps even vaccinate that from someone from, from not developing that clumping. But that's, a, that's a, a really huge development this past year. So describe what we know about that and what you find exciting about those prospects. Yeah. So look, I'm 
most excited about alpha synuclein for two reasons. One, the genetic studies in Parkinson's disease have told us definitively that alpha synuclein modifications play a role in, um, in causing Parkinson's disease. But more importantly, in non-genetic forms of Parkinson's disease, disease, what we call sporadic disease, there's this um, aggregation of this protein, uh, and that happens both in the genetic form and the non-genetic form. So it's this convergence between what the genetic biology is telling us versus the pathology in um, ordinary or sporadic Parkinson's disease showing us it gives you the confidence that if you target alpha synuclein, um, you are likely to have a disease-modifying therapy. Um, so it's, it's one of the most interesting and promising targets um, for Parkinson's disease. It's from a, the ability to target it with small or large molecules. It's somewhat complicated, but it's achievable. So this particular case, uh, Dave, that you're referring to with the first, where they are trying to come up with a way to induce our own human body's immune system to make antibodies against alpha synuclein in order to try and um, clear it so that it doesn't get the chance to clump up and aggregate into Lewy body pathology, which we think is the cause of the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. It's very, very exciting. Um, of, of all the targets we have right now, I believe alpha synuclein is the most proximal to giving us some um, kind of disease modification if, if we can target it the right way. So, Brian, um, when Kalpana refers to Lewy body pathology, that's that, that clumping again, this sticky protein that clumps up in the brain. We don't understand yet really what's causing that or, or what it, exactly its effect is. We just know that that's a hallmark of Parkinson's. And so the thought is that with this vaccine idea from a furus and there are other possibilities too, if we get rid of the clumps, we modify the disease? Is, it, is that how it works? Yeah, yeah, basically. I mean, that, that's sort of the hope. Again, you know, as you say, uh, most if not all cases of Parkinson's, you know, exhibit this, you know, clumping of this protein in the brain. And, uh, you know, although we don't know for sure if it is the actual cause of the disease, although there are people who carry a very rare mutation in the alpha synuclein gene that do also get PD. Uh, so we do think there actually is a mechanistic link. Um, but that's the idea. If we can get rid of these clumps or at least some, you know, uh, intermediate form of alpha synuclein that leads to those clumps, that would, might be protective for, uh, for the disease. And Talpana, is this does this excite the pharmaceutical industry in part because this is something you know how to do? I mean, this is a, a, a what they call a, a druggable target. Absolutely. In terms of uh, immunization, either active vaccination or passive, it's very druggable. One other thing I should have mentioned with the new research that has come out just in the course of the last two to three years. We know that alpha synuclein gets trans transported between cells in the brain, and so it does make its way out of the cells, the neurons, and that gives us the ability, if we have the vaccine method or passive immunization method with an antibody, to quickly sap it up in the, in, in the brain before it gets a chance to get to the next cell huh. to, in quotes, infect it. So uh, right now, we believe, based on the studies that have been done, is that the, the pathology progresses from one cell to the other because synuclein gets released by one cell and then gets taken up by the other. So if we have some way of putting a sponge in there with an antibody to prevent it from being taken up, you would block that progression of the pathology. And that's why this um, method makes very, very exciting uh, way of approaching alpha synuclein. I would just add Brian, to that. Brian, you think, wanted you know, to chime in, yeah. Yeah, just that, that, sh that sort of shift in understanding of, of how alpha synuclein might move from cell to cell and sort of, you know, cause pathology. I think that's such a fundamental shift in our thinking of alpha synuclein in the last couple of years where, you know, when I first started in, in, in all of this business, you know, the idea was synuclein just sort of accumulated within a cell and sort of stayed within that cell. 
and that any treatment you were going to have to develop would have to somehow get into that cell to have an effect. But, but the fact that we now think that synuclein might actually leave a cell and move to another cell and cause pathology, as, uh, as Culpin was alluding to, that makes this much more druggable and sort of the rationale for going after it in this particular way uh, much, much clearer, for, I think, for industry and for everybody. So two quick questions, and then we'll talk about some of the other disease-modifying possibilities. Um, Brian, with, when we see on the chart here that it's in phase one, the Osiris alpha-synuclein vaccine, um, what does that mean, and, and when, how long will it be until we know something that, uh, more definitive about whether this works? Yeah, so, uh, so in clinical testing, obviously, there are several phases. Phase one is just generally kind of more looking at safety, and usually there you're just giving it uh, the drug to a small number of uh, individuals, sometimes healthy you know, people, or in this particular case for a disease like Parkinson's, you might give it to a small number of Parkinson's patients. But really, you're just looking for safety, and that's really what they're doing here. The uh, FIRAS just wants to make sure this approach, since it's not a traditional kind of you know, drug, you know, a pill by mouth type of approach. You're actually injecting a what's called a biologic in this case uh, to induce the person's immune system. Um, they want to make sure that it's safe and, and tolerable first. Um, that study, uh, we hope, uh, will have results from that next year, uh, and Fearis will be reporting back to the foundation on those results next year. Um, if all looks good and safe, um, and we we're hope, hopeful that that will be the case. Um, they'll be able to plan and start moving into the phase two trial, which is when they really start looking um, uh, sort of more at, uh, at the effects of the, of the drug itself. And in that case, they usually then start moving into looking at giving one group of people the actual drug and another group of people, um, you know, sort of a sugar a pill approach or a placebo approach, really so they can actually tease out whether there really is a beneficial effect or not. And then ultimately, obviously, if that phase two trial works, you move to the phase three, which is the big sort of enchilada trial, if you will, which is, you know, many, many people, uh, much larger trial, but then really looking for the type of efficacy that the FDA will, will, um, will uh, approve uh, for, for, for a drug for this disease. We, I need to push us forward, but, but I want, it's, a, it's an important point, so I just want to ask one quick follow-up about how we'll know whether it has an effect, because this isn't so much whether or not it would change people's symptoms, make a tremor go away or whatever, but it would be being able to determine whether or not somehow it is busting up or, or preventing that alpha-synuclein spread, which means we need something that will, would be able to tell us that, right, some kind of imaging technique, and I know that's something right. that's also being worked on. But it's important to, to, to realize that what we're doing here is trying to figure out a way to stop the, the growth of the disease as opposed to just improving particular symptoms. Kalpana? Right. So this, it's a very important point, Dave, that you make. How do we monitor that we are blocking this cell-to-cell -cell transmission um, I'm aware of the consortium that uh, the Michael J. Fox Foundation has funded where, where it's an academia industry collaboration uh, with five different institutes who are trying to come up with small molecule uh, uh, pet imaging agents that would allow us to visualize these clumped alpha synuclein protein species in the brain. I was just at a workshop uh, two to three weeks ago that was again um, set up by the foundation where I saw the progress that's been made by the, the consortium where they have been able to identify early small molecules that they can further optimize to turn them into these imaging agents. In addition, there are other companies and other academic centers who have also been able to come up with these imaging agents. So my, my prediction is by the end of 2014, I'm, I'm quite confident that we would have something um, to visualize the, the clumped up alpha nucleus in the brains with, with imaging, pet imaging is how we are uh, going to be able to do it. Um, I so, also wanted to add that the PPMI study very quickly looking even at, at the cerebrospinal fluid biomarkers where alpha synuclein is one of the species. So in conjunction with imaging, the spinal fluid alpha synuclein levels might also be informative in telling us if we are uh, putting the sponge and blocking the cell-to-cell -cell transmission. 
So it's, again, really making progress on two fronts, identifying uh, uh, targets that might modify the disease and at the same time figuring out a way to measure whether or not that's actually taking place. And they, they really go hand in hand. And without both, um, we're not going to be able to make much progress, nor will we get the pharmaceutical industry to be very committed to this because we won't, we won't, otherwise we won't be able to really show whether these techniques work. Let's, let's talk briefly about um, it's ratapine and inosine, the last two arrows that we see on the bottom of this chart, Brian. Um, these are interesting um, because they, they make linkages to drugs that are being used um, for other purposes. In the case of it's ratapine, it's actually a, ch a calcium channel blocker that's used in um, uh, hypertension. And the interesting connection here is that we have seen that in um, larger population studies that people who um, um, are on is ratapine have a less likelihood or a, have a lower uh, degree of risk for actually getting Parkinson's. So the thought is is that perhaps it, this drug might might play a role in in um, modifying the way in which the disease could progress or perhaps even lessening the chances that someone would, would get Parkinson's. What are, where are we with under, our understanding on is ratapine, which is now moving into phase, phase three trials? Yeah, so I think it's an you know I think you described it pretty well. I mean it's 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 an interesting approach. Um, it, as you said, it's a drug uh, used for hypertension, um, and there had been some early work that uh, actually we we helped support um, uh, with an investigator up uh, up in Chicago who uh, was interested in sort of trying this idea out in um, to see if it would actually be protective in some of the preclinical models he was looking at, and and indeed when he uh, tested uh, as ratapine and sort of related drugs, uh, he was able to get protection in those models. So, so that along with, as you said, the um, sort of, you know, population data uh, showing that, you know, sort of use of these types of drugs seem to reduce risk for PD really um, drove the rationale for, for trying this, this drug out. Um, so right now, uh, you know, they completed their, their phase two trial. That was the results of that were just published actually this fall um, and now are actively um, working actually with the NIH to, uh, to potentially develop a phase three trial to test this in a larger number of people. And, the, and similarly, um, inosine is, is something that has to do with another indicator that people who have high urate levels are at lesser risk uh, for, for Parkinson's. And if they have Parkinson's, and if someone has Parkinson's and has a high urate level, they seem to progress more slowly. So inosine is a, is a drug that boosts urate levels. And so it's another way of sort of taking advantage of a drug initially um, put on for the, the, for other purposes that we now know can uh, well we hope may play a role in, in slowing disease progression. Um, again, we'll find out a lot more in the next year or so, right, Brian? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you know, I think you know, in both of these cases, both for inosine and azadapine, these are interesting cases and in, in sort of even challenges, um, you know, for therapeutic development. Neither of these are drugs that industry is actively pursuing for Parkinson's. Um, actually, a lot of the effort to sort of test these in clinical trials and sort of move them forward is being done predominantly um, through academic groups, uh, who are you know, universities who you know were compelled uh, by the by the data and think it's worth testing in in Parkinson's. Parkinson's patients, and obviously this is, you know, where uh, the role of the foundation can really uh, can help out because we can provide a lot of funding for that in the absence of industry interest. Um, but yeah, but the idea here is, uh, you know, in both these cases, if we can get enough data to suggest that there is some effect of these approaches in, in slowing down disease in Parkinson's, you know, that could not only make these drugs the specific drugs, you know, potentially relevant um, treatment options for people, it might actually then incentivize industry to think about the pathways that these drugs are hitting and whether or not they could develop more selective or even more, uh, you know, even better drugs uh, that act in the same way. So I think that's really kind of the goal that we're, we're hoping to have in both these cases. And it's exciting that both are, are trying to move now into phase three. You know, we still I don't know if they'll ultimately show uh, enough benefit to, uh, to justify being approved for use for Parkinson's, but this is why we're here to test these hypotheses. Dave, so could I make a quick into, point? Yeah. Yeah. Go no, ahead, I Papa. just very, very quickly. So um, this innocent story is also an example of how we could go from a biomarker to a drug target. So as you said, uh, urate levels is what 
was identified initially as a difference between Parkinson's patients and controls. That's what led to the investigators at Harvard to say, could we treat the disease by NSN? And that is what was captured on the first slide on PTMI, that some of these biomarkers would also inform a new targets in the future. So mm -hmm. I just wanted to make that point very, very clearly. Yeah, um, no, it's, uh, it's, positive it's helpful. Outcome. And, yeah, yeah. And, and uh, we're going to move on to symptom treatment, uh, symptomatic treatment developments for 2013 in one minute and get to all of your questions. Uh, but we should also just touch briefly on the big disappointment of 2013, which is the failure of the uh, nurturin, the, the growth factor. Growth factors are these proteins that help support and boost dopamine production within the brain. The thought was that we could get growth factors into the brain, that that would help preserve and boost the dopamine supply for people with Parkinson's. And the, the, the serogene trial uh, failed. A lot of disappointment about that. A lot of hope had been invested in growth factors, um, Brian Fisk. Um, so just give me the kind of 30-second synopsis of, of whether or not we were giving up on growth factors or whether or not the foundation or other researchers think there still may be some promise there despite this one disappointing development. Yeah, so, so as you said, yeah, it was obviously a disappointment for, for everybody. You know, the foundation has been, uh, you know, working with Seragene for a number of years now uh, to support, you know, this, this clinical testing. And, you know, again, I think uh, in sort of high level, I think the theory behind it is still pretty sound. I mean, I think the idea that you could deliver these um, growth factors to the brain and sort of protect um, um, dopamine cells from dying, I think is still pretty compelling. And, and I, I have, personally am not abandoning that idea. I think the challenges we face, though, in a treatment like this, as we're realizing, is, you know, a couple of fold. I think it's, you know, it's still hard to deliver these factors to the brain. You still have to deliver them directly into the brain. Um, and also, more importantly, and we alluded to this earlier, is that uh, we may be um, selecting people who may simply be too far along in their disease process to really benefit from, from uh, these approaches. And so we may have to figure out ways to uh, move this sort of therapeutic into earlier stage uh, patients. So, and I think that's, you know, a challenge, you know, in a variety of ways, in particular regulatory. Uh, the FDA usually isn't so keen on on uh, doing brain surgery in, in people early on in disease if there are other treatment options they can pursue. So, so I think it's, the field is going to be challenged more by those kinds of factors, but I think the idea behind it is still, still valid. And I should just say, you know, even though serogene failed, there are two other active trials right now for growth factor approaches in Parkinson's that are still ongoing. And so although we don't know the results of those and probably won't know the results for a while, um, those are still actually active. But it's, it's, it's such an important point, I think, and worth underlining that, again, this complete linkage between being able to find a disease-modifying therapy and having the right measuring stick, the right biomarker uh, to help us guide the way. Because what you're saying is that if we could peel off, you know, and identify different groupings of patients, some with disease much earlier on, some in in later, we can test different things. And so it may be that with growth factors that actually could work if we could identify the right patient population. It could work for patient population A, just might not work for patient population D. Is that right? And, and that, that's why these are so interwoven? Yeah, exactly. I think that's that's just the issue. I think, you know, there was some, an interesting paper this, this year that found that um, when they sort of looked in brains of people um, with, with Parkinson's after certain number of years after their diagnosis. They definitely found, you know, after about five or ten years, those individuals, at least when you look at markers of their dopamine system, uh, seem to have much less uh, of that around. And it's not surprising because we know the disease continues to progress. But I think that information just made it really clear that, you know, uh, if you're going to deliver a treatment that's supposed to protect dopamine cells from dying off, um, you're going to have to do it as early as you can because that process is continuing, and if you wait too long, there may not be something there that you can actually protect. So let's let's uh, advance our discussion and talk about the developments this year in purely symptomatic treatment. Again, these are treatments that don't halt the progression of the disease. They're not disease-modifying, but they can make a real difference in the everyday lives of people. And I just want to dive into our questions and because they, they, will, they will line up with some of the uh, 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 
treatments that you see listed on this slide. The first one has to do um, with uh, uh, a kind of inhaled form of, of cinnamon, um, a bit like a, an, an asthma inhaler in a way. And, and Saul asked this question, um, I've heard about inhaled cinnamon. Um, do you have more information? So. Uh, Brian, this is something that's advancing along um, uh, and uh, is now in phase two trials. And uh, this seems to be something that could really help people um, because, as we all know, there are those on-off cycles where you have dips in how well your drugs are working. This is something you could take a quick hit of, in essence, and get you back on again when you're off. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, we're definitely uh, excited by this approach. You know, uh, this sort of falls into our category of um, therapeutic areas where we're, we're really trying to do is help improve delivery of levodopa or cinnamet, um, because we think if we can do that, we can actually optimize um, and, and, uh, and sort of improve how people respond to, to their drugs. And so this particular example, again, it's um, you know a rescue inhaler, as we like to call it. So you just sort of take a puff of it, as you say, uh, when you need, uh, but then could really bring, you know, bring the benefits of cinnamon to, to you very quickly when, when you need it. And so uh, it has uh, been in phase two testing and is continuing to move along. And uh, what's nice about this um, particular company is other uh, other investors have gotten interested in it as well, and so this company has been able to garner some other inv uh, uh, financial investment, and so that obviously helps helps them uh, to move this forward. And it's been a good good for us because uh, it means that we help to de-risk the idea to a point where other investors can can get involved as well. So we're looking forward to it, and uh, we think uh, you know this is definitely a short-term possible um, a treatment option for for people if it continues to look promising. And the next two are also fall into a, a similar category in that these are all ways to help even out the on and off cycle so that people can have a more constant uh, delivery and a more constant benefit from levodopa therapy. So the accordion pill is like a time release kind of pill in essence. The, the patch is a different way of delivering. Give us, Brian, a quick update on those as well, please. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So again, those are just, you know, different formulations, if you will, what ways of delivering levodopa. You know, obviously the idea is that you could deliver it through a, what they're calling kind of a pump patch. Um, uh, similar technologies used actually to deliver insulin in uh, people with diabetes. Uh, but the idea is that um, you could then, rather than having to pop a pill, you know, every few hours, you would just have essentially a, a, a patch, sort of a pump patch, uh, that would deliver your levodopa throughout the day, and you would could just go on with your business and not have to worry about the timing your medication, uh, you know, every few hours. Um, similar with a accordion pill, in that case, it's still a pill, but it's just more of a time real slow time release. So it sort of sits in your stomach, and they call it an accordion pill because of the way the drug is packaged. It sort of expands out, kind of like an accordion. Uh, it sort of expands when it's uh, when when you're playing it. Uh, but the idea is. You're able to package a lot of drug in that, and over time, as it expands, the drug can be released over time. And so, again, that could just reduce the number of times you have to take your levodopa pill throughout the day. Palpin, one of the, the things we see on here down at the, the bottom of, uh, of the list has to do with um, cognition, and um, there's efforts to see if there's something we can do about the cognitive problems that can arise in Parkinson's. Um, and that's something I know the industry is, is interested in, in part because obviously cognitive aspects of Parkinson's are not um, solely Parkinsonian. There are cognitive declines that happen in other diseases as well. Is that part of what makes something interesting for industry is if they see a kind of common denominator, whether that's cognitive concerns or uh, depression or sleep issues, that these are targets then or, or ways that are interesting for pharmaceutical industry because it, you could have a bigger market in essence because it, it cuts across a number of diseases. Exactly. Uh, you put it very well, Dave. So uh, what industry strategically tries to do when we work on a, on a given mechanism is to see how could we expand indications beyond our primary indication. And as you say, cognition is one of those areas where um, there are shared mechanisms. So if we were developing a cognitive therapy for Alzheimer's disease or schizophrenia, um, if there are cognitive domains that are, that are common, to those diseases and our mechanism plays a role in, in the specific cognitive domain for Parkinson's disease, clearly it becomes very, very attractive, as you said, because it increases the market size. 
same thing is true for things such as depression, where we've had a number of drugs, but yet continued need, unmet need, and it's a, it's a major comorbidity in Parkinson's disease, where people suffer symptoms of depression um, and, and sleep disorder. So where we are developing these for other primary indications, its application to Parkinson's makes the project much more attractive. There's another reason where the industry is attracted to the symptomatic treatment because the development path, clinical development path, and the regulatory path is much clearer there than it is for disease-modifying therapy because we don't have a registered marketed disease-modifying therapy as yet. So the combination of those two uh, makes, makes it more attractive uh, for certain companies to invest heavily in symptomatic treatment of Parkinson's disease. Um, let me get to a few more of our, our questions from our, our participants today. Um, this uh, goes back to the disease-modifying uh, aspect of things. Donna asks, um, does alpha-synuclein impact only the movement aspects of Parkinson's or also other symptoms such as cognition or depression? A great question, Brian. I, do we know the answer to that, whether or not – we don't really know what alpha synuclein clumping actually does, do we? And or tell us more about what we know. Yeah, no, I think it's an interesting, uh, interesting point. We do know that, uh, and that's you know, I think we've been uncovering this more and more each year um, that the alpha synuclein sort of pathological alpha synuclein clumping can actually be seen in areas outside the brain as well in people with Parkinson's, and so we see it in the, the some of the nervous system um, that uh, innervates the. the the gut, for example, and some of the other some of the other uh, nerves outside the brain, and so we, we do know that, um, and also even in some non -neur neural tissue, we think there might even be, you know, uh, alpha synuclein uh, in saliva and some other places like that. So so it's we're finding it everywhere basically, and uh, I think what's been interesting is. Um, using that both as a way to access synuclein for biomarker research. So if we could access it from, uh, from places beyond the brain, that would obviously be much more accessible for a biomarker, but also telling us maybe whether alpha synuclein is actually playing a role in, those, um, in the symptoms that we know are linked to some of those other non-brain areas. So constipation for ex is a good example of a symptom that a lot of Parkinson's patients suffer, and is that related to the fact that there is actually alpha synuclein pathology seen in some of the, uh, uh, the nervous system that innervates the, the gut? And so if that is the case, then maybe a treatment for alpha synuclein uh, will actually also help not only with hopefully protecting dopamine cells and, and the motor problems of Parkinson's, but maybe it'll also cure constipation as well in, in those individuals. So I think that's kind of really where the real excitement is. And for there cognition a... specifically, um, Dave and Brian, sorry, just jumping in around cognition, clearly the late-stage Parkinson's disease cognitive deficits are associated with the brain areas involved in the higher level cognitive functions, the cortex specifically. So it, it's very well accepted that the, the clumping in those areas of the brain leads to the cognitive deficits we see in, in later stages of the disease. Um, so very targetable with the same therapy. Yeah, no, fascinating. And, and it leads to a, another question here from Tom who asked, um, is it understood if there's a positive function performed by alpha-synuclein when it isn't plumped? Why does alpha-synuclein exist? And is there a possibility of unintended negative consequences of targeting alpha-synuclein? Really good questions uh, again. Uh, Kalpana, can you respond to Tom's concern? Yeah, fantastic question. This is what we struggle with all the time. So it's, it's conserved evolutionarily, and uh, it was initially actually identified in the songbird. So the current thinking about its, its normal role, um, it, it's, it's, it's a set of hypotheses, not um, exactly proven, but it's believed that it plays a role in the transport um, of things like neurotransmitters along the neuronal cells when it goes from the cell bodies to where the transmitter needs to get released uh, to have its functional effects. Um, but, but that role may be critical during development, during the early stages, um, and when it becomes pathogenic in the context of aging and other insults, 
is what we need to target. So the, the specific question, would we induce any kind of adverse events if we try to set up alpha senium plane is a great one. We'll only answer it once we get to the clinic. But most everybody is trying to go after the pathogenic form of alpha senioclean rather than what we are calling the soluble monomeric alpha senioclean, which doesn't clump up as much. So you, you are still able to target uh, sort of the aggregated form while leaving alone potentially what the role of the, the physiological role of alpha senioclean played by the non clumped alpha senioclean, if I could put it that way. But ultimately, so, so I think sounds, every drug will have, be, have to be tested uh, to see whether we have adverse events, right? So the problem would be not so much that alpha synuclein per se is, um, has a, a, a negative consequence. We want it to exist sort of solely but not in groups. Is that right? I mean, we, we, it's, when it, it's when it all gets together that, that, that there's a problem. <laughs> right. Yeah. All right. Right. Um, right. Here's a question from uh, uh, from Mark about about biomarkers. I understand a biomarker was identified by a group at UCLA and Emory that showed who was most likely to be rapidly progressive in their disease. Um, can you say anything more about this? Apparently, this was a, a, a small uh, study, and, and and Brian, it may be the kind of thing that PPMI. Uh, the, the FOX biomarker initiative will be able to uh, validate with larger, larger numbers. But this is an interesting question about whether or not there are different forms of the disease that progress in different ways and whether or not there are biomarkers that could identify which of those um, are taking place. Yeah, yeah. So this it was an interesting study that that the group did. They basically were you know kind of um, exploring different types of essentially uh, metabolites that are found in the body to see which ones might be uh, linked to PD. And they did find I, I think some that uh, suggested that there might be some alterations in people. But I think what was interesting here, you know, is just again this this sort of hints at. Um, ways to um, sort of, you know, tease apart the different types of, 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 of sort of Parkinson's disease to see if you can actually, uh, you know, learn different different um, types. And, and here again, you know, I think what was sort of similar maybe to the urate story, which is, again, they found something that seemed to see to be more predictive of people who rapidly progress in their PD. And I think that's kind of, again, where the real value of a, you know, these types of studies are and that if you can find those types of biomarkers uh, that can really sort of show you the people who are, say, you know, have more aggressive disease versus the people who have sort of more of a slower disease, that could really uh, help in your clinical trial recruitment and sort of selection process. So, so an interesting study, I would say, you know, it's, uh, you know, uh, kind of an end of one study, uh, whether it's replicated by others, I guess we'll have to see. And uh, this is, you know, a good uh, example then for where uh, PPMI can play a role as well because we can, uh, you know, explore these types of biomarkers in that and those samples as well to see if they really do uh, you know, relate to, the, to, to Parkinson's. I'm going to take us back to our, uh, our disease-modifying uh, slide for a moment here because um, Tricia asked about whether or not we'll know, when we'll know if calcium channel blockers should be used for a neuroprotection effect. And again, if I, if I wasn't clear about this, I just want to make sure, Tricia, that, that we are about, um, and this, this again is the um, isratapine study, and um, either Kalpana or Brian, whoever feels uh, like they want to give this a go, but, but it's, it's an interesting thing about calcium, which is that apparently too much of calcium um, leads to this uh, a problem in a variety of ways, including perhaps in, in Parkinson's, and, and what we've discovered is that if you can use that drug, normally used for, for hypertension, it, it will do something that, that may hopefully be protective in, in terms of Parkinson's. So, um, Alpina, why don't you give this a shot? What do we know about how calcium channel blockers work in the brain and, and how that then ties into this possibility of this one drug, this ratapine, uh, being disease-modifying? Right. So, look, this is based on some very exciting work being done uh, in an academic laboratory, Jim Thurmeyers, in Chicago. And what he identified was um, that the role of this specific calcium channel um, family that's targeted by isratapine 
in regulating how dopamine neurons fire. Uh, they fire differently when um, in, in infancy, in infant brains, versus when we become adults. And so um, it is really connected, this target class, to the dopamine neuronal firing extremely well from animal studies. A big concern about this target is because of the cardiac um, channel, the heart channels, the same calcium channels that are in the heart. And so what we are all waiting to see very eagerly is can you give a dose of isratapine or other calcium channel blockers um, at a level where sufficient amount gets into the brain to block the required calcium channel on dopaminergic neurons while minimizing the effects in the heart um, so that you don't have issues of regulating heart function. And that work needs to go on in a larger number of patients in phase three where, where you monitor the heart function as well as the brain function uh, and find a dose that is not producing the adverse events but pro probably continues to affect the dopaminergic neuronal firing. Uh, nothing we can do in animal models would, would allow us to gain greater confidence in this target, and therefore I believe this phase three study that is being planned and done is the only way where we would definitively know whether isratapine or any other calcium channel blockers are going to be disease modifying for Parkinson's disease. What, what's interesting about this, and Brian, your comment on this, please, is that part of what we seem to be getting an, a greater understanding of is that there are, there are people who have Parkinson's who may progress more slowly, or there are people who seem to be at lesser risk for getting Parkinson's. And so part of this whole quest for disease modifying may be to maximize um, those things, right? So whether that's low blood pressure or, or higher urate levels, I mean, part of what we're trying to figure out are what are those protective agents, um, and, and it seems like we're maybe getting closer to identifying what some of those are. And, and, and so is that, is that why it's also important to get people to participate in clinical trials? Because we might find out, well, this guy has Parkinson's, but he's doing great, and he's doing great because he's got some particular um, agent that's, that's helping that person. Yeah, no, I think that's a really interesting sort of, uh, you know, way to look at the problem as well, which is, you know, obviously a lot of people don't get Parkinson's disease, and, and why is that? And I think, you know, uh, maybe a good case example of that is, is, you know, in talking about one of the genetic forms of Parkinson's that, that we know about. Um, there's a, a gene called LRRK2 um, that we know mutations in can lead to Parkinson's disease. And what we're finding in, in families with, with those mutations is that there actually are a lot of people who carry that mutation who don't get Parkinson's disease, and we actually don't know why. Um, and so there's a lot of effort right now to try to explore and find what other factors, you know, maybe there are other genes that actually protect those people from, from the bad effects of a mutated LRK2 gene, uh, or maybe there are other factors, maybe there are some environmental factors or some other kinds of, you know, non-genetic factors that could be protecting them. So I think, I think you're really getting at a really fundamental part here is as we are starting to clinically and hopefully maybe even biologically tease apart these different types of Parkinson's disease, um, we may actually start uncovering uh, targets that are actually protecting some people or at least, you know, limiting the, the impact of their Parkinson's disease, and those could then turn into drugs, and that, that could be ways that we could actually explore new, new treatments for people. And, and we'll, in a moment, just uh, give people some suggestions on how they can participate in uh, that clinical effort. But before we get to that, just uh, touching on a couple of more symptomatic treatment um, developments that we, we have not touched on, on yet. And um, those have to do with one of the most problematic aspects of, of Parkinson's, which can often be, uh, which is dyskinesia, which is often caused not so much by the disease as it is a side effect. Of, uh, of drug treatment, and um, uh, Brian first and then Kalpana on, um, there's, there's some interesting work being done, as, as is noted here, uh, on, on treating dyskinesia, and that has some interest in, uh, from the pharmaceutical industry as well. But Brian, tell us what's going on, and then Kalpana, why this interests um, uh, the industry. 
Yeah, so this is, you know, so obviously dyskinesia as a symptom is, you know, it's sort of this uncontrolled movement that Parkinson's patients often suffer when they're, when they're taking their, their Cinemet. Uh, it's not a symptom of the disease per se. It's actually a, uh, what we like to think of as a complication or side effect of the actual Cinemet use. Um, and there's you know, been a lot of debate over the years about the underlying mechanism for what's causing these dyskinesias. Um, but what um, that has ultimately led to is uh, uh, various approaches by groups to try to develop drugs that could actually reduce those dyskinesias, with the, really the goal being that you could then continue to take your Cinemet at the levels that give you good motor benefit, uh, but then by maybe perhaps taking uh, an anti-dyskinesia drug in combination, you could then reduce any sort of side effects in the dyskinesias that result so that you could still get the good quality benefit from, the, from Cinemet without those troubling side effects. And so uh, there have been a number of approaches. Uh, these are really just kind of two examples of some, some recent ones, uh, but, you know, there, there are others that, are, that have been out there as well, including some in the clinic. Um, these are I, what I, while we put these two on the list, I think uh, the w one from Rush and the one from the company Avenir, I think, are because these are interesting examples, uh, again, of drugs that were uh, a repositioned from other uses to see if they can actually have effects in Parkinson's. In, uh, in the case of the Rush example, to pyramate is, uh, is actually an epilepsy drug that they're now combining with amantadine, which actually is a drug used in Parkinson's to see if in combination that helps with the dyskinesias. And then the company Avenir is actually developing uh, you know, a, a, an approach using dex dextromethorphan, which is actually an active ingredient in cough syrup, uh, but also seems to have some uh, effects uh, in, in the nervous system. And so uh, that in combination with quinidine, which is just a drug used to um, help increase the amount of dextromethorphan that can get into the brain. Uh, see if the, in, uh, in combination that can actually treat dyskinesia. So again, these are examples, sort of good examples of uh, people using existing approaches to see if they can actually uh, treat uh, what is really a troubling side effect for, for uh, the use of Cinemet and Parkinson's. And, and Kelpin, I'm going to change my, my follow-up question to you just because we're a bit short on time and, and ask you instead mm -hmm. to, to address um, what you hope will happen in 2014 um, that will get us that much further um, towards finding disease modifying and better symptomatic treatments for Parkinson's. And, and honestly, what has to happen from your standpoint in the industry uh, to keep industry in, ga in the game, you know, so that the, the, the pharmaceutical industry is eager um, to invest in, in Parkinson's uh, uh, treatments? Great question. <laughs> Again, it just could take longer, but I'll try and summarize it very, very quickly. Um, De-risking targets is extremely important for the industry where the, the right biological mechanisms are uncovered by academic centers funded by the foundation and other funding agencies where it's ready for us to jump in and, and say we know how to make drugs, we meaning the general pharmaceutical industry, small and large companies both. Um, but more importantly, what needs to change is the ability to monitor if we are going after disease modification uh, monitor appropriate uh, intermediate biomarkers is what I would call it because the large 18 to 24 month trials are extremely expensive um, and so if we could get something that we could see the signal at six months even for internal decision making um, that would be tremendously hopeful uh, for, uh, and, and would, would spur more investment in the industry and I think PPMI and other biomarker studies could show us the way for that and then the third thing that needs to happen, learning from our other neurodegenerative disorders clinical trials, is patient recruitment is extremely difficult in this space. And so if we are talking about treating for 18 months, the recruitment and the completion of the trial sometimes takes three, four, five years. And so uh, the patient participation to, uh, to start registries and, st and develop what we would call clinical trial cohorts so that if somebody has a drug to be tested, it's ready to go. That would really facilitate for the field the, the testing and the development of new therapies. Well, that sets up the last point we want to make, which is the role of everyone who is participating in this webinar today, which is that we're not going to make 
progress on identifying disease-modifying treatments or new symptomatic treatments unless people participate um, in clinical trials. And so, as always, we encourage everyone to do that by signing up for Fox Trial Finder, which allows you to identify clinical trials going on in your area that you could participate in. And we wanted to particularly note uh, for those who are in the San Francisco Bay Area that there will be a clinical trial fair this Saturday from 8.30 to 1 o'clock at the W Hotel in downtown San Francisco. There'll be a display there, uh, tables from different research uh, efforts and clinical trials going on all around the Bay Area, so you'll be able to see and talk to researchers. We'll have two panel discussions. I'll be there to moderate a couple of panel discussions. So if you live in the San Francisco Bay Area, please consider coming by. I'd love to talk with you further, and it's a, a great chance to learn more about the, the ways in which all of us can participate um, in this ongoing effort. Um, and with that, we have to wrap up uh, today's webinar. I want to thank both Kalpana and, and Brian uh, for both their work and their participation. And Brian, I'll, I'll hand it back off to you. Thanks, Dave, and uh, thanks, Kalpana, again, for uh, taking the time today. So, and thank, to, thank you to everyone who joined the call today, and uh, hopefully it was informative. Obviously, we had a lot of information to cover uh, a big year in 2013, and so uh, um, um, uh, apologies if we were unable to get to the specific question that you have, uh, but we will, I think, uh, be trying to post more sort of highlights from the year and, and recaps and, and additional sort of information about 2014 uh, uh, in, on our blog post if you want to come to our uh, to our website to look at that. Uh, but also more importantly, if you found today's webinar useful uh, and would like to hear more from us, um, we will be continuing our webinar series in 2014. And uh, if you go look at this, I believe, uh, Dave, you want to switch to the next slide if you could. Um, there's a web link there for our hot topics. Um, um, there we go. Our Hot Topics uh, website where you can come and then uh, look uh, at our 2014 series. So we'll be uh, um, continuing this next year. So thank you, everybody. Thank you.